So welcome to, um, to our um, webinar. It's the first uh, formal event of a network that I'll introduce in a minute. But um, before getting there, just wanted to point out um, an image from uh, my neighborhood in uh, Stavanger Rust uh, to problematize this idea of just urban mobility transitions. Because um, we don't necessarily have one definition of what is just. Here we see um, a tunnel that takes car traffic and uh, the uh, circles in red, they show that, uh, that there's a local electric cycle shop advertising uh, cycles as being the new cars that have two wheels. And then uh, just a week later, passing over the little pedestrian bridge to uh, Johannes uh, Church, I was struck by the fact that a car company had uh, taken over the same advertising spot. So in a sense, the new car is a car. And uh, that's something that, of course, is not new to Stavanger or to uh, many cities in Norway where there's been a big active discussion, sometimes uh, quite aggressive discussion around um, things like congestion charges, around um, um, the place that different kinds of mobility solutions have in the city, whether it's cars and electric cars or e-scooters. And, um, and last year, several of us across institutions in um, Western Norway uh, founded the Just Mobility Transitions Network, which we call Just MobNet. And it's a little bit of a play on, uh, on mob justice and uh, pointing to that there are many um, divided groups here. But also, of course, we have a, po a progressive policy context where, uh, where there are ambitions to make Norway a really low carbon emissions country and the transport sector is one of the key ones that we have to change since we already produce and consume a lot of uh, clean energy in the form of electricity and transport is one area where we still haven't transitioned um, away from fossil fuels to a large extent. We'll hear more about that. There are, of course, uh, good reasons to look at Norway also for um, transitions uh, in terms of electric cars. But uh, here we see a couple of different um, examples. We see an autonomous bus that's been uh, trialed now in different locations and is currently um, doing rounds being trained to navigate the city. So there's one part of the future of mobility that is hyper digitalized where you have many um, sensing kinds of infrastructure coming into place. And there's another example here of these uh, e-scooters, El Sparkesukle, that are lying around the pavement and they are a micromobility solution that's also then run on electricity. It tries to make the center of the city easier to navigate and there are questions of whether it should uh, also spread to suburbs if that's part of a solution to move beyond dependence on cars for last mile things, if that could be worked into um, the public uh, transport um, network with different kinds of modes. So uh, we are funded by Uho NetFest, uh, which is around the western part of the country, the um, university and high school sector network. And uh, then we draw on a number of different projects that uh, have to do with this theme. Um, and I should introduce our speakers today um, because they are partly based in uh, Western Norway. We have uh, Thomas Moe-Schultzfeld, who's a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, or NTNU in Trondheim. And uh, he's going to talk about some of the things I've just mentioned about digitalization and electrification of mobility and transport and its potential societal implications. We also have uh, our friend from the East, um, Thor Håkon uh, Jackson Inderberg, who is a research professor at the Fritjof Nansen Institute in Oslo. And he will talk about smarting up the Norwegian electricity system, development so far and possible implications for the future system and consumers. And you might wonder what an emphasis on electricity is doing in a seminar on mobility transitions. And of course, uh, Tor Hoppen will tell us a good deal more, but perhaps part of the answer is found in the headline question for today's webinar, which is inclusive digitalization of urban mobility transitions in Norway, 
question mark. And that is because as we keep digitalizing the mobility sector, we integrate it very firmly with other sectors such as electricity. Of course, it also has implications for land use. It has implications for questions of financing, but really how we um, work with a low carbon transition in transport impacts the way that our electric grid, the way that our electricity production, the different sources, the rhythms, the flexibility of our energy provision itself um, is configured. So um, we're keen in this webinar to focus on cross-sectoral implications as well. But something that both uh, Thomas and uh, Tarokon can and will speak to um, is really the first word here is inclusive digitalization. Can we transform the mobility system in Norwegian cities in a way that is fair, that is just, that includes different kinds of stakeholders with quite distinct mobility needs? And um, I think you will hear about different ways in which those needs can be understood and can be taken along in the planning process. Once we've had uh, short talks by uh, each of our speakers, about 20 minutes each, we have with us uh, Harald Brunlund Lima, who works with Sveko Stavanga. He is the group leader on planning and landscape and will serve as a discussant who shares reflections based on his experience from the world of policy and practice and uh, what some of the, the dilemmas that come out of trying to digitalize and transform to a low carbon mobility sector mean in terms of social inclusion, but also in terms of the practical steps we have to take to make it make it possible. And finally, we will then have about half an hour uh, from 3 to 3.30 local time, where uh, Devin Reme, who is the research assistant at the University of Bergen and works with Just Mobility Transitions, where she will moderate a panel with our two speakers and discuss them to um, bring all of these reflections together and that will also be a chance for the audience to uh, um, speak up and uh, have any questions addressed. So without uh, further ado I will then hand over the floor to Thomas. There you go. Thanks a lot. Well, let me see if I can get this up now. There we are. Uh, you see it, I hope. <clears throat> yeah, Great. perfect. So thanks for the invitation um, and uh, thanks for the introduction. I think a lot of the stuff that you spoke about, I will actually pick up a little bit on uh, as I proceed. Um, uh, Sid hosted another event this morning where also uh, Tour and me spoke and uh, there I talked a lot about um, uh, public transport and uh, and uh, self-driving vehicles and those kinds of things. And I was kind of thinking uh, as I was planning my homework for this, should I do the same? And I and I then heard uh, Tour was going to talk about the electricity system, so I decided to go a slightly different route. And I, I hope that's that's okay. Um, so, but it'll 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 be. Um, It'll be still anchored in this uh, in this uh, headline here. I guess. Let's see. Uh, there we are. Things came up. I guess many of you have seen graphs such as this before. This is just to to illustrate to you that we are in the midst of a process where electrification of, especially the personal uh, vehicles, uh, is unfolding quite rapidly, and uh, this is a theme that has significant implications. So, you know, on the one hand, this is a big shift uh, on the transport or the mobility side of things. So it's, it is uh, a big, important part of decarbonizing uh, Norway. Um, but on the other hand, this is also a big shift sort of for the electricity system and for the uh, operators of both uh, electricity production and uh, grids and those sorts of things. So I, I want to sort of reflect a bit on that. Um, you know, there's a lot of research that has focused on um, 
what this shift means for us as uh, you know individual drivers as car purchases and these kinds of things so there's a lot of uh, at least from the social science side there's a lot of research that sort of focuses on what are the key differences between driving an electric vehicle and a fossil fuel car in terms of the potential new routines that you need to adopt to kind of new temporalities of uh, battery versus uh, gasoline tank, new sorts of meanings that people attach to these cars, you know, the sort of cultural worlds that uh, automobility is, is, is part of. And um, I, I think that a lot of this research uh, has sort of been car or driver centric or, you know, focusing on so policy effects. So, you know, which kinds of policy instruments have produced these uh, effects that uh, Norway has become so famous for, in a sense. I won't really dive deeply into that at all. Um, I think I'll, I'll zoom out a bit and look at some of the broader implications of this transport uh, electrification. And, uh, you know, just to give some examples to begin here, I, I think that uh, when we think about merging mobility and electricity systems, uh, this creates a lot of new issues that, uh, that emerge at different types of, of scales. Uh, there's a lot of new micro politics that emerge around this, uh, these links of infrastructures and I'll, I'll return to that soon. And, and especially uh, what I'll return mostly to here is actually how we think about infrastructure for charging and how that kind of feeds into both uh, how mobility systems change and how um, we can think about this in terms of inclusivity. So just some, some general reflections first on some potential dynamics that we can see, you know, when we, when we merge these systems of mobility with these systems of, um, electricity production and provision. So, you know, one of the things that, that happens on a very basic level is that um, as we electrify mobility, we sort of internalize the temporalities of mobility into the electricity system, which means that we, that we, that we create new uh, strains on the electricity system in terms of uh, new types of peak loads, new types of uh, uh, issues that needs to be dealt with on various levels uh, of, of the grid. Um, and this has all sorts of implications. Um, another element that, uh, that happens that I guess we perhaps do not think as much about is that while we internalize the temporalities of mobility into the into the electricity system, we also sort of externalize potentially some of the some of the controversies that we see in the broader energy transition domain into the mobility field. So this these images are they might be difficult to connect to the theme of urban mobility transitions because they're you know from Bærelevog far into the north of Norway, which is not exactly an urban hotspot. But uh, uh, what, they're, what they're doing here is uh, combining wind power uh, with uh, uh, electrolysis and they're combining wind power with uh, uh, technologies to produce green ammonia, which um, are essential for sort of fueling the marine um, um, transition to, to, to greener uh, transport. And, and it's, it's a different way of thinking about electrification. And, but, it, but it signals uh, how, in this case, you know, controversies over how to use land, for instance, uh, in competition with uh, the needs of um, reindeer interests and, and, and things like that. They, 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 um, they now suddenly uh, feed into discussions of how we, for instance, uh, transport ourselves on sea outside of Stavanger and, and uh, other places uh, around Norway. And then, you know, third sort of dynamic that uh, is quite general, but I think is, is interesting and, and, uh, and worth thinking about is that 
as transport and electricity merges, you also have the, the emergence of, of a range of new types of actors and a range of new ways of working, basically, uh, that um, here is illustrated by OSCO, which is a very traditional sort of grocery wholesale company uh, that um, has now started producing a lot of renewable energy uh, and feeding that into, again, hydrogen production and truck production. Um, uh, with large potential implications for uh, yeah uh, transport across the country. So these are some these are some quite generic things that are emerging. Um, now, if we zoom in to um, more specific things that I wanted to talk about, so these are some generic elements. Um, I'm, I'm interested here in, in, uh, in, in the things that emerge around electric vehicle transition in terms of charging and, um, and how charging actualizes a lot of, um, I would say, political questions and also questions of uh, inclusion and, and uh, the themes of this uh, webinar. Um, we came to this uh, as as researchers in a kind of unexpected way. We were uh, actually part of a, a European project some years ago where we were supposed to do a case study on car sharing. And we had identified a set of building blocks where there were some car sharing schemes going on. And we figured this was would be super interesting to go study them, look at the car sharing. Uh, when we came there, it really struck us that the car sharing was not all that interesting in, in this uh, case. But what was interesting was that um, uh, across these uh, buildings, these are four buildings that you see uh, on the screen here, and four related garages. And these four garages, they're governed by four different governing boards uh, who had four widely different schemes of governance when it came to implementing uh, charging facilities, basically for electric vehicles. And uh, so it struck us that well, that's quite interesting. This is one building. Uh, this doesn't look very feasible. So we started looking into what one of the janitors of these buildings described as um, contemporary infrastructural anarchy that uh, was in some cases unfair and in most cases quite unfeasible. Um, now, uh, you've probably seen these kinds of uh, newspaper clippings emerging where, um, uh, where there's been controversy, very local controversy concerning um, how to deal with electric vehicle charging. Uh, we have a lot of uh, early adopters who bought their EVs uh, quite some time ago, who's made you know, substantial investments in uh, charging infrastructure privately. And we're now coming to a sort of situation where uh, there's so many of the EVs uh, coming online that it doesn't really uh, make sense anymore to make this fully individual um, decision how you should how you should um, proceed with uh, implementing these uh, infrastructures. So around uh, charging, uh, you know, we 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 saw that it emerged a kind of particular form of uh, micro politics. Um, this raises a series of questions. So who are responsible here? Is it the individuals? Is it the collectives? Is it the uh, elected boards of uh, neighborhoods? Is it you know, some politicians? And um, uh, building on this, there's also the relationship, which is still very active, I would say, between the electric vehicle owners and the non-EV owners. Uh, Again, you know, this, this might be translated into an issue of, of justice. Should I really, with my diesel car, pay for my neighbor's chances of charging his uh, EV? 
those kinds of things. But also sort of broader issues of fairness, uh, you know, when it comes to access to mobility, when you can charge, where you can charge, how you can charge. And uh, one thing that sort of um, emerged from this re research quite early that was that um, electricians had a pivotal role as sort of activists in this field. They had kind of identified this infrastructural anarchy and um, really saw it as their task, not only to help people install um, as many charging points as possible, as early as possible, but to do this in a way that, um, you know, alleviated uh, some of these uh, equity and justice uh, questions. And they were, this is really kind of big theme in a series of interviews that we conducted with electricians who had been very active in this uh, era. And of course, then, as I guess, uh, Tuud will talk more about uh, later, a very sort of parallel development to this is kind of smart grid uh, digitalization of the electricity grid um, as a parallel and hugely uh, with a big potential kind of so uh, to solve or uh, help out with some of these issues. But even though you have uh, the potential of digitalizing, it's, it's not given that it happens in a fair and just way that addresses all of these issues. So uh, we, we kind of zoomed in further of this kind of collecting housing booted slug. Uh, if you're a Norwegian, you know these booted slugs are a quite particular uh, site, especially for kind of the, the political aspects of it. Can be quite fun to look into. And uh, the thing there is that you have uh, individually owned um, apartments, but you have a lot of collectively owned infrastructure, which is typically the buildings and the lawns and the parking sites, but also the, the in this case, the emerging um, charging facilities. So um, one interesting element of this for us was to look at how elected boards of these uh, uh, collective housing facilities, they kind of transform themselves from being uh, actors who, you know, primarily um, deal with when to paint, when to refurbish, when to change the windows, these kinds of things, to actually becoming instrumental in managing uh, pretty large chunk of the energy system. So in this case, uh, which is actually one of the largest Buddhist logs in Norway. Um, they were, uh, at the time of study here, they were, they were installing almost 800 charging points uh, in a number of large collective garages. So, which is, you know, quite significant thing to engage in for kind of, uh, for that kind of, uh, elected volunteer uh, board of, uh, of a Buritslag. Um, so we sort of argue, uh, this is from a paper that is in, uh, in review now, uh, that um, this electrification process of Norwegian vehicles, it, it has sensitized a large number of actors. Um, to some of these generic challenges that are associated with the energy transition and has produced massive engagement actually around electricity grid issues that has proven very difficult to sort of instigate in more classically oriented uh, standard sort of smart grid projects which has uh, this uh, um, goal of uh, advancing engagement in the energy system. Um, and. Uh, so this is kind of an example of, um, of a meeting where uh, a, a board uh, convinces its, uh, its uh, tenants uh, of the merits of choosing one smart charging facility over another. And, uh, and they were kind of really diving into a discussion here about the energy prices and the nitty gritty of peak and base loads and the relationship to access to transport and uh, uh, those sorts of issues. 
Um, again, you know, hugely democratic process ends up sort of in a vote, a very distinct for or against electric vehicle charging in this case, which is, um, and this is not a drill. This is, you know, really they're, uh, they're deciding on future infrastructure here that will be active in these buildings uh, for potentially decades to come. So it's, uh, so it's pretty, pretty interesting in that respect. Um, you know, to, to bring this uh, slightly more actively back to the theme of, um, of digitalization, I mean, uh, the, if, you, if you go to this area now, you will not kind of recognize the smart city or anything like that uh, in the way that it's typically envisioned in, in, in glossy images. This is still, uh, you know, 1950s, 1960s Norwegian Bodetslag. So it's a very mundane form of digitalization, which has uh, enabled some quite surprising actors, I think, to, to really kind of take ownership over some uh, elements of the energy transition. So while you have uh, some big actors involved here uh, on the software side, this is not your, you know, uh, Google's or your Amazon's rolling into a city and, and transforming it in their image. More broadly, um, kind of, some of you might not take this, uh, this reference that I have here, but uh, those of you who take it might, might appreciate it. Uh, the, you know, what we're seeing here, I, I'll argue is, is that, uh, so the electrification, uh, which is unfolding, is it, kind of part of, of an acceleration of a, a transition, and uh, and that brings some new types of, of challenges. So, so ten years ago, we were discussing how to get EVs uh, implemented, how to get uh, renewable energy technologies implemented. Now that is happening on a large scale, and that produces. Uh, new challenges, uh, challenges of coordination and, and uh, challenges which require new types of local politics, I guess. And I'll, I'll end with a series of questions because I, I, Sid asks us to do blue sky stuff and what is that, but questions. Um, so, you know, my think about this is sort of clash of systems, mobility systems, electricity systems, and um, some of the things that might emerge is kind of more precarious grid. You, you may have new types of precarious relationships between yourself and, and mobility in a sense, lack of access to mobility, but also you might think about this in terms of, um, you know, a window of opportunity for new ideas. It is an example, I think, of how new type of innovation emerges. And I, that has kind of been, written a lot about in the literature recently. Then there is the question, you know, if this is radical, is it incremental? I made an argument like this uh, to some people in the research council last week saying that uh, this is pretty incremental stuff because it's not really transforming the mobility system in any way. It's, it's really reiterating the material structures and urban forms which are anchored in ideals of individual car ownership. They were pretty annoyed with that argument because, uh, you know, uh, the EV was considered a, a radical uh, innovation in that uh, view. So you, you could think about this also as kind of missed opportunity, I'd say, for kind of, you know, now you have the uh, electricity system and the mobility system merging. Could we then use that moment to rethink, in this case, it's more suburban mobility than urban mobility, but rethink what that could be, what that should be. And um, so I've added a question mark there to be a bit diplomatic, but I think we should. Yeah, and uh, here you see I've been too quick because I've just reiterated the last half of that slide uh, in another slide where what I really wanted to do was uh, just to finish here. So uh, that's it. Um, Hope it made sense and I'll stop my sharing and hand it over to Tour. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. I'll um, share my screen and we'll go from there. Uh, yes. Um, 
Can you all see this Peter Nansen slide? Yes. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I think this is uh, complementary to what you you have been presenting, Thomas. So I'll I'll, I'll just uh, go into this and uh, and we'll uh, touch base more also in the in the in the discussion later. I think. But um, what I'll focus on here is is um, really the electricity system, but with implications for transport, obviously. Um, uh, by smarting up, I'm referring to digitalization. It's a very difficult word for a Norwegian to say, but I'll, I'll um, keep saying it, I think, through the, through the presentation. Uh, my main focus is, is not on, um, uh, the backdrop will be, of course, the technical, technological developments that are taking place, but, but I'll focus on the policy aspects of this. So we have policies that are uh, uh, driving the di digitalization, and that you can keep that in back of your mind through the presentation because that that's that's one of the main arguments here that that um, these are tech, of course technologically driven, but they're uh, highly um, politically driven as well. So, what do we mean by digitalization, and what is it? I think we just have to start there before we carry on. And, and by, um, by, by this um, very a uh, little bit informal um, definition, uh, by the digitalization, I mean the, the connection of physical uh, components. Um, so they become monitored. These components become more increasingly monitored uh, by sensors and uh, often by two way connected. So they speak to each other basically. Um, and this is this is what I think mainly by digitalization here. Often it's it's talked about it very very um, like Thomas showed I think uh, in a slightly futuristic terms and uh, and uh, grand visions, and it's often held to be helping to optimize systems. It contributes to steering uh, the the electricity systems. It can contribute to to uh, increase resilience of the systems in different ways, and certainly provide um, uh, much better grounding for for uh, steering and, 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 and analysis to, to, to develop uh, more precise policies for. Uh, we have automatization and P2P trading, aggregator and, and vehicle to grid that, that also I think Thomas touched upon when he was talking about smart charging. Um, so I'll, I won't go into all of these. These are the background for the for the discussion rather I think. And, and uh, another additional background that we need to keep in mind, I think, is, is basically that I often start with something like this in my presentation because it's so crucial. But the Norwegian electricity system, it, it, if you look at this map, you know, this is a very old map, it's from 2008, but it's quite representative uh, still today. And, and, um, and it's not that many maps at this level being produced. Um, if you look at the Norwegian map, you see the uh, square dots uh, scattered around the country, and, and these are, are uh, hydropower plants mostly. It's still Norway is still a very hydropower dominated country, um, and you see quite um, uh, fragmented uh, transmission lines between these nodes that bring the transport electricity down to uh, the grid levels, uh, down in distribution grid, and to the end consumers. If you compare that to Sweden, you see the big red lines. There are five, 400 um, kilovolts lines. So that it's a much more robust grid um, with uh, basically a, a highway from the uh, production nodes in uh, uh, mid north of Sweden and down south to Sweden where, where the, where the um, consumption of electricity takes place together with the nuclear reactors that I, they have down there. Very cleverly placed down closer to consumption. So in Norway, this is this is um, something that uh, this this is nature given characteristics of, of the uh, the, uh, the electricity sector, and by digitalizing this, uh, it opens up certain new possibilities, uh, perhaps for for uh, for how we use and how we consume and how we transport electricity. All of this is regulated uh, or or. or Managed by, and I'm, I, I have an affinity for for grid companies. They are they are uh, the crucial, very crucial elements here. Um, we, in Norway, they remember that these are monopolies. So we have um, today 128. They are reducing the numbers gradually, and they are regulated monopolies. So 
um, they have certain tasks and they're heavily regulated. They cannot make more income than they are allowed by the NDE, basically. These 128 grid companies, they range from uh, the biggest one, Elvia, of 2 million users around the uh, uh, Oslo region to numerous, very much smaller, uh, down to 500, uh, sorry, 5,000 end users, um, grid companies serving local uh, distribution consumers. So all of this is, is, is the background for also some ongoing transitions that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about digitalization. It's only one, we're often talking about the, um, the electricity or energy transition in, in the singular terms, but it's, it's really not. It's, it's several transitions. It's not just decarbonization. And we, when we're talking about Norway, we're not really talking about decarbonizing the electricity sector itself because it's, it's mainly hydropower and wind power based now. So um, digitalization and technological developments have, are, are one of the main uh, transitional uh, drivers that, that, that we see with smart meters as an enabling factor. So I'll get back more into that. Uh, a central national data hub, uh, enabling new grid tariffs, new energy services, and a lot of, of things coming from there. We also have uh, generally changing production and consumption patterns to, uh, in, into that map that I showed uh, in the previous slide. We have, uh, have more production of uh, electricity. We have more um, electrification. Electrification is only one of the decarbonizing uh, got decarbonization strategies that we can, can use, but it's in Norway, they're clearly the, the main one. Um, and we also have some small scale generation developments, albeit much uh, weaker than in most of the countries with about, I think last year we passed 5,600 house residential solar PVs on the rooftops. So, so it's, it, that part is much weaker. We have some uh, this decentralization otherwise though, uh, with, uh, with um, new, the digital era enabled by the smart meters are, are, are really, um, enabling this, but we don't we don't really know to what degree and in what forms this may take. In, uh, ultimately, um, we also have EU integration, of course, which is actually one another form of, of transition of the of the Norwegian energy system. What we do not have in Norway is the decarbonization uh, that I mentioned, and also it's significantly weaker energy citizen or, or energy community trends than we see elsewhere in Europe. And this is this is a marked difference. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit different from, from there. So on the technological side, I'll just mention this. So we do see that, of course, that grid companies are investing in, in sensors and monitoring equipment to, to increase resilience and, and monitor their grid. Uh, but it's highly varying. It's not really... Um, um, uh, nationalist steer, like some of the aspects I'll come back to in, in the next few slides. Uh, so we see very varying strategies within the, the, the grid companies. Um, they are investing in, in new smart control units, feedbacks to displays uh, also at the consumer level. So all of these kind of are lumped together very often in, in a sense to, to provide a description of digitalization. Um, there are also uh, significant and very important pilots done often by the grid companies, um, uh, sometimes on islands to, to provide uh, opportunities to the alternatives for grid development, uh, where we see production, we see uh, um, styming of, of, of uh, consumption, uh, we see um, um, storage and other, other aspects that, that will, uh, is likely to to contribute to, to, the, to the experiences and development of, of the Norwegian, uh, future Norwegian uh, electricity system. And also, of course, the EV uh, electric vehicles, uh, charging infrastructure, smart homes, prosuming all other, other aspects that are there. But now over to the policies that are driving this. Um, one of my main points is that smart meters uh, are, are crucial for development. It's, it's a co cornerstone or, or, or a first major step for, for providing a, a full digitalization of, of, uh, of an energy system, electricity system. Uh, in Norway, Norway was reasonably early, far from the first. Uh, Sweden implemented some form of smart meters in 2009. Others were even earlier, Italy. Um, and these were in Norway, they, they 
kind of started to kick off around 2004 when the grid companies uh, and uh, today what's called Energy Norway came together and, and, and started to, to explore the prospects of, of smart meters. Back then it wasn't seen as economically rational at the societal level, um, but around 2004 there was a report changing this somewhat and then, then things started to kick off. Um, this was driven by back then by technology developments, but after a while and, and some orientation and discussions, the grid companies basically came to, to agree, um, uh, always, albeit some quite reluctantly, that, that it would be a good idea to, to uh, roll out and implement smart meters in Norway. So um, long story short, it was implemented by 2019 and it's quite visible for all of us since we have a new meter in our, our, um, our uh, uh, house. So this means that um, this, this smart meter, it, can, it will report automatically, so we don't have to uh, read our meter and report it ourselves anymore. And it reports every hour. In, a, in some time, it will report every 15 minutes. And this is, and it can also be, be um, closed down it can, from, from uh, remote steering. So the implication of this is that it's, it's access to big data. It enables other technologies and, and new policies will, will arise from this. And we see this already. And one thing that happened subsequently to to the decisions around the, the smart meters is the national data hub called LHUB. This is not unique in, in Europe. Denmark has had one, a similar one operational for a few years. Um, it was decided in 2015. It was less of visible in the public domain because we don't, it, it doesn't uh, impact the, visibly impact the, the consumer as much. Um, uh, and we saw the migration of data from grid companies who were sitting on this data in various forms prior to 2019. It was migrated into a unified system at El Hub itself. So if you look at that figure on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the to the right here, you see the, the this is uh, from El Hub itself and they show, try to illustrate how the reporting and communication between the different uh, different um, actors in the electricity system took place before, prior to the impl implementation of LHUB, where everybody basically had to talk to everybody and it was not very effective. And also the quality of, of the data were, were um, not quite as high, uh, they claim. So after LHUB, everything goes into LHUB and they take care of and, and, and cater for these data. And, um, and that has actually quite a bit of uh, efficiency um, uh, gain, uh, but also it's uh, held to be a neutral uh, actor compared to, to um, the grid comp companies who are officially neutral as well. Um, and it will be a, a more, uh, a, dif a different uh, approach to, uh, a more um, unified approach to, to, to the data uh, across the, the whole electricity system. So it, they also provide access to, to third parties to uh, different, in, in, a, in a different way than, than before uh, after applications. So the third and um, last policy, I'll, I'll say something about that drives really the, the, the digitalization of the uh, electricity system is the, the virtual trading. It's not in effect. Uh, it's been on the table since 2010 or thereabouts when uh, our regulator, the NVE, um, uh, bans shared metering in uh, the boarded slug that Thomas talked about, so the housing associations. So um, uh, from then on, uh, it was not uh, possible to have a shared meter where people could use electricity from different areas of the building and different uh, legal units. Um, and then NVE came up with, uh, with the idea that they could use LHUB um, for, for uh, uh, virtual trading. So um, uh, where one dwelling, for example, can virtually transfer rights or, or generations uh, accounted for done in another dwelling. And this is at, at the moment not possible. Uh, there, ha there has been, the, the, the solution came with LHUB. It has been some um, obstacles on the way, primarily because uh, there are different, uh, it touches on different regulatory uh, regulations. 
uh, of course, the metering regulations, but this this is resides under the NBE, so that's that's not really a problem, and that seems to be um, more or less dealt with, although it's not public yet how how it's uh, how the ultimate shape uh, will be. But also, it touches on the elavgift, uh, which is a tax, uh, electricity tax, and that resides under a different ministry. So the the tax authorities um, could not find the solution, and at the moment, it's it uh, resides in the Ministry of Finance, and we'll see what happens then. Uh, but this, this virtual trading has, is seen to be quite important both for um, electrical vehicle charging uh, stations, but in particular for utilizing, um, utilizing uh, prosuming so solar panels on the rooftops of, of Boritslag houses and associations. So this is a... Is a this is an area in Norway where, where um, Norway lag, lags, uh, lags um, behind other countries quite significantly, uh, both in general, but also uh, compared to single houses, where um, it's not it's it's only a handful of wood slag in Norway where we have prosuming, uh, and the main reason for this is some other obstacles be, uh, um, because of this uh, ban on shared meeting, uh, shared metering, but. The ban itself can be quite reasonable, but this is one of the uh, implications and perhaps unintended consequences of that uh, ban back in 2010. So, if this comes to be, it it has to reside on. It has to come from. It's been enabled from the smart meters. Uh, it's been enabled by smart hub, and here we see some sort of a, a development where uh, one thing enables the next. Um, and it can facilitate more flexible, flexible prosuming for shared roofs uh, and, uh, and uh, charging infrastructure. So this is my second to last slide here, uh, where I will try to say a little bit more about the imp possible implications. And I'll do the headlines, um, not overstep too much on, on time, I think. But um, uh, what we do see is that smart meters um, are enabling further te technology development and further digitalization. So what we see is that LHUB power grid tariffs, which is another aspect that I haven't been to, uh, really talking about, also peer-to-peer -peer trading, the virtual trading I just talked about, and use of uh, electric vehicle infrastructure is really enabled. All of these are enabled by the first steps with the smart meters. And we see that digitalization drives digitalization. So it's a form of a evolving path dependency or a, or a pathway with increasing returns. We also see that that um, there are there are actors, new companies established, the more digitalized this is, and they they contribute also to pushing these developments ahead. So the, the, we already see that the traditional actor uh, constellations in the electricity sector is, is, is changing because of these, these developments. And this contributes also again to drive the digitalization ahead with implications, of course, for transport and other, other areas. Um, it does facilitate decentralization, um, prosuming, storage, microgrids, um, I've touched on that. Um, uh, what is interesting with the Norwegian approach is that all of these regulations are mandated nationally. In, in, in a number of other jurisdictions, um, then we have we have shades of gray here, obviously, but uh, it's in in many places this is um, left to the to the market, so to speak, which means that it's up to uh, grid utilities and other actors to to develop the digitalization, and then we have the anarchy uh, that uh, Thomas was referring to with the charging infrastructure. Uh, so this is this is it's it's heavy processes, heavy regulatory processes in Norway, but at least. Uh, with, with its own challenges, um, but at least we don't see the anarchy that Thomas showed with uh, with the charging infrastructure. Um, so this this decentralization and and, um, and and the digitalization also has potential to optimize the grid and also to to choose other options than, than grid development. There are other ways of providing electricity to households and other uses than than developing grid and, and increasingly so. Um, it does fac facilitate decarbonization. Uh, I think that's a, a statement that is um, that uh, will hold um, because it assists in it reducing the intermittency or variable production problem in uh, in with new renewables. 
Um, and it's also what we refer to as sector cobbling, but particularly for transport, where we, we are able to, to um, there are there are cleats here, but it's it's it facilitates the the, the charging and the, and the infrastructure there. So, but there are of course um, a number of unanswered questions, uh, particularly on the social side that uh, that uh, I won't go too much into. But uh, consumer privacy, data protection issue, issues are are frequently um quite questions and brought up um albeit less so in norway than in in uh many other countries uh, like the uk or or or, or in uh, other places in europe um the impact on vulnerable groups and participation active participation in the electricity sector is uncertain we don't know this this might empower already powerful actors or, or resourceful families over more marginalized groups uh, and there might have distribution as, uh, effects on this. Um, so that brings me to the to the last slide, which is really the the uh, the sun map, uh, and I can't even see the top because of some uh, because of the there we go. Um, Zoom control panel is on top of that. Um, so I think it's uh, just to sum up. I mentioned very clearly that I think that the digitalization drives technology it is driven by technology um, but is also driven by policies uh, and i didn't really mention too much about consumer expectations but that is a, is a clear driver as well particularly for the grid companies um, uh, in norway it's um, important i think to to remember that these are developed by national uh, mandates uh, which is not the case in in uh, some other countries uh, and this it doesn't have to be so. Um, smart meters are really a key enabler for later developments, and they do create path dependencies that we need to be aware of. Um, and of course, they can contribute, as I mentioned, to decentralization, decarbonization, but we have to um, put the social questions on the agenda so we can uh, deal with those in a, in, a, in a proper manner. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Harold. Over to you then. <laughs> Thanks. Jumping off the Virkola, I would say. <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> uh, to Rokun and Thomas, thanks for uh, great stuff. It's really interesting. And to uh, complementing uh, viewpoints. Uh, I noted down some stuff before you guys started talking, and I noted down some other stuff when, uh, when I heard you guys. Uh, my comment will probably mostly aim at what uh, Thomas uh, talked about. Uh, so just to frame the, the theme, I figured just uh, talking a little bit about me and my uh, situation as a house owner in an area outside Stavanger, who happens to also be an urban planning expert <laughs> and architect. Uh, I uh, got an electric vehicle eight years ago. Uh, so that was like one of the second wave of electric car uh, pioneers. I had great uh, pleasure of using it. Uh, it was a new way of driving. And uh, initially, it was free to charge. You can uh, charge for free in the Stavanger area. The Lisa Grid Company, they provided uh, three, four stations around the Stavanger area. And you can charge your, uh, your, uh, your car up for free. It was like Nirvana for driving a car, really cheap, and you can recharge it for free. And it cost about about six or ten kroner every night to charge it overnight. But rarely uh, we uh, we use all the battery because we had a ferry taking us across the fjord. Now uh, we had a new tunnel, a big, big new highway tunnel under the sea between Stavanger and uh, fjordlands to the east. Uh, so now my eight-year-old uh, electric car is too old. I have to sell it. I can't use it in this steep, steep tunnel. So instead of buying a new one, I discussed with my wife about uh, leasing or lending or a car clubbing or car pooling. And I don't want to buy another car because that's the, at the core of the issue of me uh, when I talk about urban planning because the car is, is parked uh 23 out of 24 hours a day it's parked it's standing still 
And this about parking policies, I can talk about it con continuously for a week probably. <laughs> uh, and that's the power of urban planning. It's super slow, but it's actually super powerful. And most people don't understand how powerful it is, uh, at least not politicians who seldom they read the papers that uh, we used to compose working in a municipality. Uh, and urban planning is really, really hard. It's really hard and it should be hard because it's, it lays the foundations for our physical lives for the next 100 years. And 100 years, Seco, where I work now, we have 100 years. And we have this electrification barometer. So we try to uh, convey that now this Norwegian society is getting more and more electric, more and more electric. Uh, and uh, and uh, back to my house, uh, I bought an old house. Uh, I wanted to build, live centrally. Uh, on urban connected in a, like a apartment with a shop downstairs, right? That was my ideal as an urban planner and architect. My wife disagreed. <laughs> so then we ended up with a whole house. It was not new, not in a field outside the city, nice urban sprawl, but into a small town called Tau. And it was old. My house is 70 years old. I'm taking care of a home which is as old as my dad. Uh, and this house has an old roof. I want to put PVs on it. And I also want to have a battery that takes the solar power to charge it and then charge my car. And perhaps I can use my car to that. So what Tor Håkon talked about is also interesting, but I don't understand so much with the electric, electric stuff, uh, this uh, grid uh, politics and policies. That's, I need to learn from you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, to Thomas, he says that there's there might be a missed opportunity for radical rethinking suburban mobility or urban mobility. And I would say, uh, no, not yet, but soon. <laughs> uh, I'm in uh, discussions with uh, some forest people who want to develop the autonomous mobility solutions for the Savanger area. Uh, and, and they need urban planning experts, they say. And I say, yes, you do. <laughs> Uh, because there's like, a, I said, urban planning is really slow and really powerful. And if you couple that with how people live and the local uh, local politics a couple of years ago, this Bumpeng Operator, this uh, road uh, pricing, uh, people didn't like to pay even more for their car usage. And that had, that makes sense. I was part of the commune people, the municipality people who pushed for this, who wrote the papers about it, how pro and cons. But we also got to know that most kindergartens uh, were placed were, were not having a capacity of the kids of the kids who live there. So people had to commute to drive pretty far to deliver their kids, right? Uh, and we also have a, a twenty year legacy of building more and more roads, and then not having a proper alternative, everyday mobility, the just mobility, it becomes really, really hard. So we, we have we have inherited uh, we have inherited unsocial space. Uh, we, we have an unsocial city already. And then how how can we make it even more just? Well I I firmly believe in putting a cost on road usage. When everyone is using the road, it should be cost more. It's like a, uh, it's a capitalistic, uh, capitalistic principle, economic principle. If you have little of it, you, it the price goes up. That makes sense. Uh, but you also need to have alternatives. And what's what's interesting with this electric mobility, if it's shared or if it's micro mobility, these uh, small kick bikes, then the range as uh, as urban planners use when we make cities. <laughs> Uh, in the Stavanger Sanders area, we are we're having a double tracked railway station, and we want to have another station there, pretty close to where I grew up, actually in Lura, uh, um, in the middle of Stavanger Sanders, basically. So we we wrote a lot of papers to have a new train station there, in the in the seaside, and we said, as we said, the 20 and 20 last years, 500 meters from a bus stop. You can have more houses there. And from a train stop, 1,000 meters from a train stop, you can have more people. You can uh, you can densify. You can put more houses there. It should be done in a good way. Uh, la 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 la. Right. But now 
with the electric mobility or like the shared mobility, but the but the mobility gets more power, electric power, it gets more range. So I would I would argue that actually two kilometers from a train station you could densify, right? So these uh, five thousand hectare houses you don't need to put it uh, in a one kilometer one one kilometer range. You can put it in a two kilometer range. That that's a good thing because then you don't then you have more space putting it in, right? And then you can do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. But now the municipalities don't plan for uh, this electrically powered mobility. They don't plan for electric kick bikes. Uh, and also, I mentioned the the uh, unsocial space. Uh, we inherited the unsocial space because the network of biking, the network of walking, the network of driving around when you don't want to when you don't want to own the car, is not there. It's not good enough. Oslo is. I understand that they're getting there, right? But Stavanger, Bergen, Trondheim, other urban cities, other area, urban areas in Norway, we don't have the network. Uh, for instance, uh, we are using 1.5 billion Norwegian kroner on a new Sikkelstamvejen, a high standard bike road between Stavanger and Sannes, north south, running parallel to the highway. And that makes good sense in some ways, and in other sense, it doesn't make good sense, but it's coming. The government is paying for it. Uh, so it's coming, but the municipalities and the local authorities, they really don't feed into it. Uh, the roads are, uh, access this to get that good, they could get more bike rides. It's not there. Yeah, I'll, I think I'll pause there. <laughs> I might have other points also, but uh, important is we inherited an uh, unsocial space already. And it, we, we could do things right. Uh, if we do th now within the next, next five years, and for biking basically. Great, thank you, Harold. That uh, sets us up beautifully to have uh, you and Thomas and uh, Tor join a panel that uh, Devin will now moderate. And uh, there are also uh, uh, there will also be scope for questions from the audience that she will bring up with the panel. Yes, hello, I'm Devin. Um, and uh, all three of our speakers brought up some really interesting points. There's so much to pull from, but um, I think I will, uh, I have two primary um, things I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you on since you're experts on these uh, systems of innovation change. Um, and the last point that Hoddled made about how we've inherited um, sort of unsocial spatial arrangements means that these transitions aren't gonna be painless, that inclusion and justice issues are gonna be central. So um, I wanted to start by asking um, when, for you guys who I, I gather are, are thinking a lot about systems change, um, when we, you, you brought up the Bordach log and sharing and um, these issues about putting solar panels on the roofs. And I thought about the uh, initiative for positive energy districts. And I wanted to ask you if it's it's sort of inevitable the way that we're doing things in Norway, um, and, is, and is this positive that the wealthy are going to be the first adopters and that um, when it comes to say prosuming where it's also an opportunity to make money or Tesla's where you get these um, all these benefits. Um, it is the model we wanna go with that the wealthy will be the first adopters and that these green innovations will sort of trickle down to low income residents? Or do you think it might be a good idea to start thinking about uh, making the lowest income or the most marginalized people the first adopters? I um, <clears throat> I think that, that question is probably for me. Um, I, I, th I think that's a very good question. And we have seen some developments that have been clearly um, going in that uh, direction, particularly with uh, electric vehicle adoption. So when you have a, a transition with, uh, with uh, public incentives, um, there is, there's, uh, it's natural, I guess, that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the affluent or those who can access those goods, they can, they can also reap the benefits of those incentives. So in, in a sense, from, from a, a transition perspective, without the social dimension, it would be um, positive because they, they clearly the incentives work so they, they do what they're designed to do in many ways um, so I think I think maybe your question is what is that fair <laughs> and uh, and so um, I don't think that this is uh, is entirely fair and, and we have 
we're in the beginning now of, of defining a project where we see if it's actually overlapping with other issues like um, is it the same people who drive an EV and, and um, uh, reap the benefits of reduced taxes and, and, and uh, road taxes and, and, and so on? Is it the same people who adopt uh, solar on their solar cells on their or on their rooftops? And we don't and we don't really know that yet. Um, but we expect some overlap at least. There are there are very different different big differences in numbers here and stuff. But uh, um, uh, but I, uh, so so uh, that that would reinforce the problem. I think we, if this is the case, if we find that this is the case, then it's it's uh, as if if you believe it's a problem in the first place, then it would be a stronger problem if if it's a, a clear correlation between those two uh, adopting groups or if they are the same. So, but what, what measures could you put in place to deal with that then? It's, um, that's, that's the question. And I'm, I'm not sure if the measures necessarily can be or is natural to, to direct them at the, at the same, at, directly at that problem. For example, it would mean that you would, I don't know, subsidize electric vehicle for, for vehicles for certain groups or something. And I, I don't know if that would really prove feasible um, but perhaps there could be other other um, if, if you if you lift about the, the the very concrete example I think maybe if we can think of mobility in wider terms it could be possible to find measures that could at least reduce some of the inequalities for example if this provides people if these are, um, are represent if these represent barriers for people to um, to move around then uh, maybe it's possible to find other. I think in the UK they have uh, um, free public transport for retirees, for example. Uh, these kinds of measures might, they, they won't, I don't know, they, they might help, but uh, I think it's difficult to find very precise measures on a general level that, that would uh, have the desired effect uh, down to the individual level at least. Mm. Well, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I think there's a, there's a great opportunity in the municipality planning process, which is really slow. And then the somewhat quicker process uh, governed by the, the regional uh, mobility companies. In Oslo, you have Rutor, and you have uh, Brakar, and you have uh, ATB, and you have A2B, and you have Columbus, where I live. And what's great about Columbus is that they develop like a, a wider range of uh, mobility services. Uh, they said publicly a couple of years ago that they want to they want to uh, offer cars, private cars, as a shared like a build quality a co co share co shared cars, <laughs> basically. So if this is also coupled with the uh, planning processes where we make new garages, we make them smaller, and we make them only for shared cars. Bergen and Oslo and Asker is already doing it. They're, when they're making new houses. The parking garages are only for shared cars. That's not the normal mode of urban planning for houses, but it's getting there. And if we also get a wider, a wider uh, menu of mobility, that's uh, then then we're talking because then it's uh, then uh, people lead by example. And also, I can I can report from this Stavanger area that uh, the urban planning transport boss, my one of my former colleagues, he's biking electric now. And also, one of the leading politicians last 20, 20 30 years, he's he's biking electric now. So these old proponents of car-based uh, urban sprawl, yeah, they are older than me, but they discovered the electric bike. And other municipalities outside Europe, they are they are not making new car uh, new highways for cars. They are making new, new highways for bikes, because the electric bikes is feasible to commute for 25 kilometers on a bike. Electric bike is possible, and it's it's seen as as a way to connect urban centers. And if you then uh, remember what Corona taught most of us office workers or paper movers, is that the lo local area where you live. It becomes even more important. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to, to deliver my, my girl in a, in a bike or walk with her to the kindergarten because I can. I don't need to commute to the office location, right? 
And that, that gives me greater life quality. But I also get really critical. Now, I don't know if my, my, my kid should walk to school here in some years. This is not good enough. I don't want to pay my taxes in this uh, municipality because they are not adapting for, for soft mobility. They're not adapting for me having a good uh, environment here. So if the municipalities and the people living there also could be more critical to where they live and demand uh, better shortcuts for walking, better uh, specific qualities. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more optimistic that it could be more in, of an inclusive change uh and, and then instead of the trickle down tesla <laughs> way maybe of, uh, start a bus riders union yeah 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 <laughs> i'm i'm excited to hear uh, your input also uh thomas yeah i uh, i was interested to to comment on this i guess from a slightly different perspective so i i re i i think i agree with your analysis devin that um a lot of these um, schemes uh, seem to be uh, innovated from and implemented from a perspective where the default user is affluent, basically. And uh, I think that goes for the you know developments that Tour Hokum talks about in the smart grid field, and a lot of the stuff also in the uh, in the mobility field. And uh, and and you know if it's a concrete policy measure that uh, that that can do something about that, I think um, well uh, you can think about planning and stuff that targets various uh, groups and and so on and so forth. But I think there's also something substantial to be done there in terms of uh, you know innovation policy. So a lot of this development as it unfolds today is funded by public body institutions, so ENOVA, Innovation Norway, Research Council of Norway, uh, and uh, uh, typically, you know, actors tend to adjust to these actors' demands <laughs> for some reason. Uh, uh, so if, if, they, if they more actively target, you know, the, well, we're doing uh, electricity flexibility over the next year, but we're actually targeting specifically people who don't own their own house, who live in social housing, and who, um, who, uh, yeah, they, they might be students for that part, it could be different groups, but uh, then, then I'm pretty sure you would see projects with very different logics than you have in, you know, uh, Turoko mentioned Valer and, and Senja, they're not particularly poor communities, uh, they, they are, uh, uh, you know, Valer, I've been there and done field work myself, and it's impressive what they've done, but they also have a lot of money to play around with. So uh, a lot of big cottages, a lot of big cars, a lot of big houses, and uh, uh, that is not, uh, that is a kind of default mode of innovation that I, I guess serves its purpose, but which only brings certain sort of strata i guess of the population on board so yeah I, I i agree with your analysis and i think that um more strong institutional push to actually doing it inclusively uh, is possible and is desired i just want to supplement and what i mentioned earlier this uh, the columbus and the regional bodies of mobility uh, they are often they also govern uh, democratically and they have like yearly yearly action plans. So uh, what Columbus is doing, they are delivering different mobility services. So if they manage to do this in a in just as a successful way as they did with the the package called Yem Yob Yem, Home Work Home, uh, then you can get an inclusivity. That you can reach more people. Uh, initially for four hundred Norwegian kroner a month or five hundred kroner a month. You can travel as much as you would, as much as you like, on electric bike, bus, and train. And if if they manage to uh, expand this to electric kick bikes and cars, uh, that then then you got a mobility for then we have mobility, mobility as a service. Uh, and the the catch there is that only big companies uh, in the surrounding areas, municipalities, only they can afford to buy in in this uh, scheme that Columbus uh, uh, developed. Uh, yeah, and, and also from Corona, we learned that not only the where you live is more important, but I think most people also should learn that 
you don't need to travel so much. So uh, ideally, you wouldn't need your car as much as you thought five years ago. You can, it should be possible to, to go to your local, walk to your local shop, to bike to your kindergarten, right? So this thing about less transportation, that's also crucial. But again, uh, we inherited the unsocial city. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if my 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 kid can walk safely to school, and I really don't want to drive her. <laughs> but but we we have built this city, but it's not, it's not good of, enough. Um, two of the things you just brought up lead me perfectly into the second question I wanted to ask you guys. Um, the first is that um, as part of our project, we also looked at car-free zones. Um, so, you know, this built environment that would allow for that, and, and one of the things that's attractive there is that they hoped it would also reduce trips taken um, and maybe reduce leisure travel if it, if it improves the um, environment people are living in, that's the hope, um, and that it's a low-tech solution, whereas we're often looking for these high-tech, uh, digitalized, smart mobility um, solutions, so I, uh, I'm attracted to car free zones for that reason. But the other element you brought up, um, mobility as a service. So all of the collective operators in Norway are, are moving in that direction. And um, I've interviewed them and I've interviewed Dr. Tussinit and I wanted to get your guys' perspective on this uh, tension between um, data-driven development and these potentials that you brought up in your talks. And then on the other hand, um, uh, Dr. Tussinit, the Norwegian body that uh, protects um, uh, personal, uh, personal data, for example, um, that they are generally opposed to data-driven development as a concept, um, uh, and the data should only be collected for very specific purposes um, and for no other reasons, and uh, not sort of vacuumed in to see what we might be able to do with it. Um, so I, I wondered if you guys had any opinions on the, the tension there. Yeah, I mean, uh, are the data are the data possible to identify people, or is it not? That's also a crucial question. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago we uh, looked down into the possibility of getting mobility data from uh, where people have their phones on in urban area, and in my view that will be interesting because then we see the load of how many people who are there at a certain time and where they travel, right? But if we can if we can think that uh, the data should be open data, that the municipalities or the regional authorities collect it and then give it out later, then we could get innovation out of that data. But of course, the mobility companies will see their proprietary uh, value, or the value of that data out there is my traveler's data. But it's not exactly their individual movement data, right? So that's that's interesting. I don't know so much about it, but it's super important to discuss it, to get the ethics straight. Um, I, I'm certainly no um, data privacy expert uh, at all, but uh, I have noticed that in in some of the hearings that we that I presented, um, some some behind the policies that I presented, it, it has been um the the topic has been there um so i think the observation that i have made from from those uh, hearing data is that data is is uh, crucial they um they need to have uh, they need to take care of this but i'm not sure if this is already always um at odds these two considerations between data driven development um and the, the privacy data protection um I don't think we should assume it that they automatically are at least um, with the smart meters. It's obvious that this is, this is these are gathering enormous amounts of sensitive data that we produce on an hourly basis, and that can be if if they were accessible, that's we, that makes us highly vulnerable. Vulnerable. They can be used for for a number of of um, vicious ways. But but um, as long as they are protected well, I'm I'm. Uh, I have some trust personally. I haven't studied this, and I'm not. And they are GDPR um, compliant, of course. And and so it seems to be uh, as long as you say they are they're gathered on this for a specific purpose, and they're 
catered to and stored in a safe way uh, and not used for any anything that is uh, um, beyond uh, the original intention then uh, then maybe maybe it's okay maybe it's it's uh, it's uh, it can be a feasible and, and um, positive development as well um, and I, I think that that, that data was was uh, very much present in these questions when when we were developing those those regulations at least but I have noticed that uh, it's a high level of perhaps naive trust in Norwegian by no, by Norwegians compared to other countries in these issues so I don't know if who's right here well, you, you mentioned the smart uh, earlier with the smart meters um, that they had uh, first every hour and then every 15 minutes. Uh, Dr. Tosinet opposed this at court, the 15 minute uh, change, and they are very adamant about it not being real time. Um, but their concern is also uh, we're thinking about how it might change in other countries since we're a front runner. Their concern is about the social contract and that things might change at a governance level and and um, to protect citizens from their own governments as well, um, which we don't tend to worry about in Norway, but if we're setting a model for other countries. <laughs> True. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how this would play out in the US, for example, but, uh, but in, this is, this is less so a question in, in Norway, but from, from seeing some of the policies, policy developments up front, we shouldn't be naive about it. There are vested interests, obviously, uh, but I think there are, uh, we, it shouldn't be um, too concerned either, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I was a bit surprised by the direction of the question. But you started about talking about the car-free zones and the, and the road tech, and the, so. But, but I, just to comment on this uh, data privacy and potential values and stuff like that. I mean, well, it's probably well within GDPR and 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 so on and so forth. But there's already some pretty bleak examples of digital data being used for instance in uh, uh, in in uh, companies with fleets of drivers where you collect a lot of data on stuff like driving style driving speed uh, and so on and so forth and you use that to create a basically a point system where you rank drivers according to the performance and this can be on uh, you know, environmental uh, uh, attributes, or it can be on safety attributes, or on various kinds of of, uh, of scales. And I, I, you know, I might be too gloomy in my outlook here, but uh, I've, I've maybe I've seen too much uh, dark mirror. But uh, there's something. I mean, imagining those dynamics taking place also amongst you know people who don't drive professionally, but who just use mobility services, uh, be they, you know, your rides or your uh, buses or whatever. Um, I don't think it's too far of a stretch, but, but yeah, it's, it's not, I'm not afraid of it, but I, I would, uh, I would be keen on taking it seriously, at least. <laughs> If I, if I may add, there, there is a distinction between the LHUB uh, public uh, curator of these data and, and if it's accessible to private companies. I think that's a, an important distinction to make as well. Um, so it, it got brought up also a little about cultures of mobility, um, but well, particularly by Hoddled, but I think uh, Thomas as well, in terms of um, social expectations and I'm curious about how you guys view um, the future of, of the urban, ur, urban and rural difference here. That it, is the EV adoption basically to, to maintain, to allow people to stay outside of the cities? Um, and, uh, or, or is the long-term goal here to, uh, that the EVs are a bridge as we, as people are, um, urbanize more th and then they are, able to access the common systems of the public transportation. I can try. I mean, I, I, I don't see that as an either or. So, sorry, Harald. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it as an either or, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, I don't think in the Norwegian context that a district's politic and this political ambition of having uh, people around the country um, will sort of 
disappear anytime soon. And I mean, we have a kind of industrial and uh, and uh, commercial uh, structure that you know we it'll be a long time until everyone can live in Stavanger, uh, Trondheim, Oslo, and and these places. And uh, distances are vast. So I, I think that uh, it, the EVs are definitely a way to uphold a sort of mobility culture where you can traverse these distances. Um, but on the other hand, to kind of counter myself, I think that uh, the diversity in the stuff that is enabled by batteries. I mean, we've heard today about everything from the e-scooters to the large buses. And um, so the electric mobility, I, I think, is also something that uh, will cater or can cater for new types of urbanism and uh, urbanization and uh, so on and so forth. So it's, for me, this would be a kind of boring, uh, both ends of the stick answer, I think. It's good, but I hadn't even thought of, uh, of course, the technologies and the EVs can be used in a lot of other ways. Yeah, uh, well, I agree with, uh, with uh, the stuff that uh, Thomas uh, says. And and I, I just want to say out loud, remember, EVs, they're still cars, private cars. So they, as Thomas said, they will uphold the mobility uh, patterns we still have. Uh, but if uh, the corona crisis have shown us that a new type of uh, week, work week, private week, have family week, mobility needs, if that picture is different next year or the next years, then I I believe that uh, stronger or better or more cohesive networks at home, place specific networks would, could grow. But uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, but I do want to say that mobility uh, um, authorities can act quickly. Uh, urban planning is slow, but uh, pandemic response was really quick. And uh, uh, transitioning to the climate uh, friendly and green environments, it's slow, it's hard. But again, authorities could be, could be quick, not only pandemic, but they could be quick when a refugee crisis is looming. Uh, three, four years ago, we got uh, in municipalities, we got a lot of letters from from the government. There's a lot of refugees coming. They're coming and we need houses. So we need, we got these special letters saying that uh, you can bypass laws. You can just just build houses for the people coming. So the authority, we can be quick if it's possible, not only for pandemic purposes, but also for other uh, deemed uh, acute needs. So we just need to remember that and uh, look ahead. <laughs> Some of the videos froze in my uh, in my view. I don't know, see that if it's only at my place or seems to work uh, over here. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm I'm hearing you guys. So that's the most important. Uh, I will um, pass it over now to Sid for some final comments. This was great. Thank you, guys. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Devin, for. Uh, moderating Harold for uh, your very engaged uh, participation and uh, reflections and of course to Thomas and uh, Torhokon for giving us a lot to think about with their uh, with their talks and discussion I just wanted to say thank you also to the audience even though we haven't had a lot of questions I take it that it's because you've been riveted with the discussions uh, you've heard um, and that the that just mobnet the just mobility transitions network does uh, have several other upcoming activities uh, we'll put out word as we go along but uh, part of the ambition is also to engage in artistic ways to put up an installation for instance at the uh, the petroleum museum and uh, as and when things open up a bit uh, with the pandemic to be able to do things in person as well um, as we talk about and open up space to think about different ways of mobility in the city being possible. So thanks for your attention and uh, thank you to all the speakers for giving us uh, some things to think about in terms of what that future might be. Have a good afternoon ahead.